Okay, let's see what you guys think. Question one. When he says that women planning to remarry must be their own social justification. Um, this is because at the time remarrying is seen as a very odd and strange thing to do. Like if your first marriage failed, why do you think someone would be willing to marry you again? is the traditional thinking. So any, especially women who plan to remarry, have to be able to give some kind of explanation. Uh, the question and Waythorn focus on women because traditionally women were in charge of the household and the home, in charge of family life. So if the marriage fails, people will often blame the woman for not being able to solve the problems. At that time. Of course, now we know that marriage is uh, cooperation between both people. So only blaming the woman is very unfair, but this is the traditional thinking. So if the marriage fails, a, a woman who plans to remarry must have some kind of explanation. The second part of this question, the inquiry of society. So when someone try uh, in society, famous in society that people know, when someone like this tries to do something big, such as marry or remarry, um, everybody will want to know what's going on. It's like gossip, right? Uh, so, oh, she wants to, uh, she got divorced. What happened? Who, what, like, uh, what was the reason? And now she wants to remarry. Who's the new guy? What are their backgrounds? Do they fit? This is what Waythorn thinks of as social inquiry. And the question here is, do these two ideas contradict each other? Are you able to fit these two ideas together? One group took this question and they think that these two ideas do fit together. In this case, if a woman must justify her remarriage to society, how does she do that? Can she visit everybody and like loudly say like what a terrible ex-husband her man was? probably wouldn't work because uh, usually the louder you complain, the more people start to think maybe you're the problem. Again, not very fair, uh, but this often happens. Uh, in Chinese, we call this 二人先告状. So maybe she has to do this another way. For example, um, maybe she does go to join lots of parties, lots of like meetings and social functions, but she absolutely refuses to discuss her previous marriage. Maybe when somebody asks her what happened, she can simply say something unimportant and neutral and not blame the man. Maybe she does these things and similar things so that her own image is clean and people will naturally think it's the fault of the other side. So we see that how such a woman justifies her remarriage is by using social inquiry. If people want to know, you can use that curiosity to bolster your own image and let people think it's the other person's fault. So in fact, these two ideas go together. Without social inquiry, there is nobody to justify yourself to. There's nobody to judge whether you give a good reason or not. And of course, if uh, you there is no social inquiry, then you don't have to give a reason. So these two ideas are two sides of the same coin. Number two, who has more power in the marriage? This was a very popular question. 
Um, and in a way, it gets at the heart of this story. As we all know, Mrs. Waythorn has two ex-husbands, which is very strange at that time. And so people naturally think that maybe she has less social power. But social power may not be the same as power in a marriage. Because Mr. Waythorn knows that she has two ex-husbands and he chooses to marry her anyway. So could that mean that he has less power in the marriage? Uh, the point is social power does not translate easily into marriage power. We have to look at how they behave in the marriage. From the very beginning of the story, Waythorn already is thinking to himself about this situation, about how everyone told him it's a bad idea to marry her. She has two ex-husbands, but he keeps thinking that she's still a good woman. He thinks it's a very good idea, and so he marries her. But he's still thinking about this. He cares about this, even if his conclusion is that he still wants to marry her. Then their daughter, Lily, I should say Mrs. Waythorn's daughter, Lily, gets sick. And according to the law of divorce, the daughter's father has a right to be included in discussions about Lily's health. They, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Waythorn both agree that Lily should be living in Mr. Waythorn's house. Therefore, any discussions between Mrs. Waythorn and her ex-husband about Lily's health probably will take place in Mr. Waythorn's house. And Mr. Waythorn has to agree because he has already agreed to follow the law and he has agreed to have Lily in his house. So who has more power here? From this first beginning, it does look like Mrs. Waythorn has a little more power. And uh, after the short break, we'll come back and look at how this power relationship develops in the story.
Returning to the question of the power balance in this marriage, something very interesting happens on page eight. So this is the first time Lily's father comes to visit his daughter. Um, in order to avoid Haskett, Mr. Haskett, Waythorn has been out of the house all day on purpose. Now he has come back for dinner. After dinner, he talks with his wife. Did Haskett come? He asked with his back to her. This is also very interesting. He's not facing her. It's like he's too embarrassed to look at her. When talking about this issue. And she answers, oh yes, he came. You didn't see him, of course. She hesitated a moment. Why? Why does she hesitate? And then her answer is, I let the nurse see him. So I did not meet him at the door. I sent Lily's nurse to meet him and bring him up to see his daughter. Why does she hesitate? Maybe because this is surprising to her. She maybe did not expect that Waythorn would think like this. Waythorn does. Uh, Waythorn expects her not to want to see her ex-husband, but maybe she does not feel like that. Maybe she actually did. Go meet him at the door and bring him to Lily. And when she says, I let the nurse see him, she's lying. Later in the story, I think we do find out that this first meeting, Haskett and Mrs. Waythorn did meet, did see each other. So we do learn later that here at this point, she decides to lie. So at this point, who has more power in this relationship? The person making demands or the person lying? I think the person who's lying has more power because she has more information. She has a decision. She has what we call agency, xing. She can choose whether to make her husband face the truth or to lie in order to keep the peace in this relationship. On the other hand, her husband has a very clear position. You're not supposed to meet your ex-husbands. There is no choice here. There is no freedom. He has this attitude and there is no gray areas in his attitude. So I think Mrs. Waythorn's freedom gives her more power in this moment. Later, as we read the rest of the story, we slowly realize that most of their interactions are Mrs. Waythorn does something or says something. Mr. Waythorn says, don't do that, don't say that. And then she says, OK. It's that last point. Every time she says, OK, it's a choice. It's something she decides to do. In order to have a peaceful, successful third marriage. And then when we get to the end of the story, a situation comes about where all three men end up meeting, and it's nobody's fault. They all end up in the library because, um, this is page 15. They all end up in the library because a sudden leak had that morning given over the drawing room to the plumbers. So the drawing room has a leak, 客厅漏水, 
Therefore, everybody is in the library. Waythorn only has to meet with Haskett. Sorry, Waythorn has to meet with Haskett and with Varric, but he did not plan to meet with both of them together. It's only because of this accident that they all meet together at the same time. So it's not Mrs. Waythorn's fault. And yet, when Mrs. Waythorn enters the library, she does not find this situation embarrassing. This is page 16. Just as Mr. Waythorn is about to lead one of the men into the dining room to discuss their separate business here, but as he placed his hand on the door, it opened from without. Here, without means outside. And his wife appeared on the threshold. The threshold is Mengkan. So like in front of the door. She came in fresh and smiling in her street dress and hat, shedding a fragrance from the boa which she loosened in advancing. The boa is a kind of, uh, I guess you would call it a reverse scarf. It's kind of like a fur. Yeah. A boa is originally a kind of snake. So it's using that shape for the name of this uh, closing. Next, shall we have tea in here, dear? She began, and then she caught sight of Varric. Her smile deepened, veiling a slight tremor of surprise. OK, so she is surprised, right? She doesn't know that he will be here. But her next reaction is not to be embarrassed. It is not to uh, find herself at a loss for what to do. Her next response is, why, how do you do? She said with a distinct note of pleasure. So she puts on her hostess image. She welcomes him uh, in a happy voice. So you can say, OK, very fast reaction. But there's another man behind. As she shook hands with Varric, she saw Haskett standing behind him. Her smile faded for a moment. Again, surprise. But she recalled it quickly. Recall here means get back. So she got her smile back quickly with a scarcely perceptible side glance at Waythorn. In Chinese, we say, so like this glance is like a question, like how did this happen? And then her very next reaction, how do you do Mr. Haskett, she said, and shook hands with him a shade less cordially. So a, a slightly less polite greeting, but still polite. Up to this point, she is surprised, but she is not embarrassed. And yet the men, the three men stood awkwardly before her. It's the men who are embarrassed, not the woman. Till Varric, always the most self-possessed, so the person who's always the most in control of himself, dashed into an explanatory phrase. He quickly went into an explanation. And then in the next paragraph, Haskett also gives his own explanation. And then in the final line of this page, she, uh, she swept aside their embarrassment with a charming gesture of hospitality. In this case, it's probably a gesture of welcome. So in this entire situation, very embarrassing for the three men, but for the woman at the center of their lives, only surprise, no embarrassment. So, Mr. and Mrs. Waythorn in this scene, who has more power? I think it's the person who's not embarrassed who has the more power. 
Because if you're embarrassed, you, that means you care about this thing, and this thing is like controlling your thoughts and your feelings. But if you're less embarrassed, you have more ability to adapt and more ability to manage the situation. And indeed, the way that she manages the situation. Remember, Varric gave an explanation, Haskett gave an explanation, and in order to be polite, Mrs. Waythorn also gives an explanation on the next page. I'm so sorry I'm always late, but the afternoon was so lovely. She doesn't have to explain herself, right? The embarrassment is not because of her, it's because of the men, but she gives an explanation anyways, just to be polite. And then her first action, before talking business, she added brightly, brightly here means cheerfully. I'm sure everyone wants a cup of tea. So even though the situation is strange, maybe a little embarrassing for the men, for Mrs. Waythorn, it just means we need an extra cup of tea. Right, so the final line, she glanced about for Waythorn, so she looked around for her husband, and he took the third cup with a laugh. He also realizes it's not that serious. Really, the end result is we just need a third cup of tea, and that's it. There is no real problem. There is no reason to be embarrassed. Like my own Chinese teacher told me in high school when I confessed to him that I had a crush on another girl and she didn't care about me and I was very embarrassed. He said, the only reason to be embarrassed is because you feel embarrassed. So there's no reason. Uh, so from this end point, if we look back at the whole story, the whole story is about Mr. Waythorn thinking about his wife and her two ex-husbands. He's obsessed with them. And at the end, he realizes maybe it's not their problem. Maybe it's my problem. So in a way, the author of this story is kind of giving us the idea that divorce is not that serious. Remarriage, not that serious. It doesn't have to lead to problems in the new marriage. And that's that's what creates the power imbalance is that Mr. Waythorn cares too much about her ex-husbands. And this is very interesting because throughout the story, it is Mrs. Waythorn who keeps saying, OK, yes, I won't. She is, as question five says, pliant, flexible, obedient. And this is what is expected of women at that time. So she does have less social power. But in this case, the fact that she has less social power gives her more power in her marriage. On the other hand, Mr. Waythorn has higher social position, but he's also expected or he thinks he is expected to defend that position. He is the husband, not her ex-husbands. He has to draw a clear line between him and those two men. So he has less freedom. He has less choice in his own mind. So his greater social power gives him less power in his own marriage. I think this is an important lesson of third wave Feminism, the sample Lang Chao, the Nu Xing to Yi Ring Dong. Yes, women should have the same rights as men, but we should also remember that men often also have problems and issues related to gender. Just because men are more powerful in society in general does not mean that every man has a better life than women do, and that often social power can bring its own problems. OK, number three. Why do you think the desire to keep clear of embarrassing topics might backfire? Let's look at this page. Nine.
near the bottom. It seemed more likely that the desire to keep clear of embarrassing topics had fatally drawn him into one. So in this case, the more, according to Waythorn, the more that Varric tried to avoid this embarrassing topic, the more he ended up talking about it. So his effort to avoid the topic actually made it more likely for him to talk about it. Why is the question? One group took this question, or two groups took this question, uh, and the answer that I heard was that if this is an embarrassing topic and you're still thinking about it, that means it's an important topic. And if it's both embarrassing and important, you're going to keep thinking about it. Even if you try not to talk about it, you're still going to keep thinking about it, and that will change how you behave and how you talk. So avoidance is also a kind of engagement. Have you guys seen the movie uh, Inception? Right? In, in near the beginning, when somebody is explaining the idea of Inception, the example is, quick, don't think of a pink elephant. What's the first thing you think of? A pink elephant. So negation is also a kind of engagement. So the more you try to avoid it, the more you will end up talking about it anyway. And that also says something about Waythorn, because he's always thinking about his wife's ex-husbands. And the more he thinks that maybe something strange might be going on between his wife and her ex-husbands, maybe the more likely he is to actually believe that. So this story is also about the idea of anxiety and unfounded fears, things that you actually don't have to worry about, that you don't have to be afraid of. Number four, what is over-the-counter politeness? A few groups also took this question. And is there any other way to be polite? Let's look at page 10. So this is when Mr. Waythorn finally meets Mr. Haskett. All this time, Mr. Haskett has been coming to visit his daughter and Mr. Waythorn has been avoiding him. But one day he enters his library and he sees this guy. And the guy sees him and says, Mr. Waythorn, I presume, I am Lily's father. 你是威廷先生吧,我是Lily的父亲. This is the first thing he says to Waythorn. Not, hello, how do you do? Not, I'm so sorry to be in your house like this. He says that next. I am sorry to intrude, said Haskett. So first he says, ah, you must be Waythorn, I am so and so. And then he says, I'm sorry to intrude. Do you think that feels polite to Mr. Waythorn? Maybe Mr. Waythorn would hope that the order would be reversed, that Haskett would first say, I'm sorry to intrude, and then say who he is and why he's there. So when he later adds, I'm sorry to intrude, Waythorn thinks that it is over-the-counter politeness. What does that mean? This comes from medicine. Over-the-counter medicine is medicine that you can buy without asking a doctor first. 
就是非处方药。So it's available. It's easy to buy. It is less valuable. Maybe this is how Waythorn is thinking about Haskett's politeness. It's easy. It doesn't cost him to be this kind of polite, and therefore it is not very meaningful. It's kind of like going through the motions. 只有形式而已 So. The second part of this question is: How else can one be polite? Is there another way to be polite? Is there a better way? Well, as I just mentioned, maybe Haskett should have first apologized and then explained who he was. In that case, he would be recognizing Waythorn's feelings first, and then coming back to explain himself. But if he presents himself first and then apologizes, it feels like he's thinking about himself first, and only later remembers that he should apologize to Waythorn. Maybe that's why it feels less polite. So a better way to be polite is to think of the other person's feelings, to deal with those feelings first, and then come back to. Say or do what you wanted to say or do. To put the other person first, perhaps would feel more meaningful and sincere. Number five, Waythorn thinks his wife's pliancy is because she has left a bit of herself in each marriage. So the idea here is, why is Mrs. Waythorn so flexible and obedient? Every time Mr. Waythorn says "Don't do this," she says "Okay." Why? Apparently, Waythorn is expecting that his wife might try to debate with him, to argue with him, but she never does. And he thinks this is because every marriage has taken something from her, so that there is less and less of herself that wants to argue with him, and there is. Less and less of herself that wants to defend something, and that's why she is so obedient. Whatever he wants, she agrees. So the question for you guys is: Does that make sense? Nobody took this question, so it's my question. I think on the surface, it's possible. If you care, sorry. If one cares about one's marriage, and it doesn't work out, and it happens again a second time, then maybe one will prioritize trying to keep the new marriage working, regardless of personal opinion, regardless of any deeper problems. Maybe Mrs. Waythorn cares most. About keeping together her new marriage, and that's why she's so flexible. And that's just another way of saying what Waythorn is thinking. She has left a little bit of her actual self in her previous marriages. She cares less about her own opinions and more about staying married this time. Possible. It's also possible that. She's not actually pliant. She's not actually flexible and obedient. We saw previously that she lied about not meeting Lily's father. So is it possible that she's only performing obedience? Maybe she has her own thoughts, and if. Mr. Waythorn has not banned her from doing something. Maybe she'll do it. That's another way of thinking about their relationship. Why does Waythorn need to keep saying, "Don't do this, don't do that"? Is it because she keeps on doing this kind of thing? There's a moment in this story somewhere. At a party, Waythorn finds. His wife, 
talking to one of her ex-husbands. And he thinks it's strange. But his wife says nothing wrong was happening. We were just talking. But if you don't want me to talk to him anymore, I won't. If Mrs. Waythorn were actually pliant and actually trying her best to do what her new husband wants her to do, then after Mr. Waythorn tells her not to meet with Lily's father, she should know that he would care if she talked to her ex-husband at a party, right? That makes sense. If even to talk about your daughter's health, your husband does not want you to talk with your ex-husband, why would he think it okay for you to talk to him at a party? So if she's actually pliant and obedient, this would not happen. So maybe Waythorn got it wrong. Maybe she's not pliant and obedient at all. Maybe she is performing obedience to keep him happy and to stay married. Now, this does not mean that she is a bad person. It does mean that the first statement in question five is kind of true. She is now less willing to debate and discuss each point, and she's more willing to try other ways to keep her new marriage going. Is it healthy? Probably not, but it is a result of her marriage history. You know, just because two people disagree does not mean one person is wrong. This is very important. I'll say it again in Chinese. 两个人意见不同, so her behavior in this story is not to hide something bad. It's simply to avoid potential conflict. Because of her marriage history and her current thinking. OK, and then question six. How can you tell the story was written in the 19th century? For this question, we go back to page one. One group very bravely took this question. And they point out that. In the early 20th century, near the end of this period. We had a play called The Melting Pot, Da Rong Lu which gave us, for most of the 20th century, the central metaphor of American society. People from different backgrounds all living together. And we do see this in the story. Waythorn thinks that Varick and Haskett are from two different backgrounds, and yet their lives are all connected through the same woman. And there's a scene where Waythorn takes the subway and he complains to himself about how he has to squeeze in with everybody else from different backgrounds. So it is true that the story shows us a kind of melting pot society. At the same time, of course, Waythorn is uncomfortable with people from different backgrounds. So it's not really melting together. But it feels like it and it looks like it. This group also pointed to the next line, social clubs, women's clubs, and the new woman. The idea being that now that women had relatively more freedom, relatively more education, what will they do with those things? How might they lead their lives in a different way? And in this story, we do see that Mrs. Waythorn has her own life. Most of the day, Mr. Waythorn is at work. And we don't know what Mrs. Waythorn is doing. 
This question is not even mentioned until the very end of the story when Mrs. Waythorn says, I'm sorry to be late. It was such a lovely day. And she's wearing her street clothing. Clothing that she wears to go out. So that begs the question, what does she do when she's out on the street? What is she doing that made her late? The question comes very late in the story to add tension. Waythorn already is kind of embarrassed and paranoid about finding both of her ex-husbands in his library. Then she walks in reminding him of her own independent life all day long. It, it's as if she's an entirely different woman from the Mrs. Waythorn that feels obedient and kind and selfless. Uh, and then this heightened tension is then later resolved using three cups of tea. So we do see in this story the idea of women's independent lives, the new woman, women's clubs, that kind of thing. What else do we have? The story takes place in New York. So we have urbanization, which is one cause of the melting pot. Different people all gather together in the same city. We have consumer culture. Why does Mrs. Waythorn have street clothes? as opposed to like in addition to dinner clothes and party clothes and sleeping clothes. Maybe these items were more available with the onset of uh, consumer culture. We have realism. This story is not about portraying the perfect lives of rich people. The story really gets into the details of how one man thinks about his wife's previous marriages and ex-husbands. It does not paint a beautiful picture. It paints a realistic picture. On that same point, we can look at social science and anthropology, the study of humans and human society. Isn't this story also a kind of study of the mindset of a man whose wife has been previously married. It seems like this story is from that same perspective of like trying to see and understand someone's life and situation. It's about rich people, so we can also mention Carnegie's gospel of wealth. The idea that rich people are good for society because they can use their money to benefit all of society in this story doesn't happen, but it does bring up the idea of a society where people sometimes are incredibly rich. Um, and that's also embedded in the name of this period, the Gilded Age, massive wealth inequality, very rich people and very poor people. I think that's mostly it. So we can see these ideas in this story. So if on the midterm question I ask, I say, please read the other two by Edith Wharton. How can you tell that this story was written in the late 19th century? You can mention some of those ideas, point to where those ideas appear in the story. Give me the page number and say, therefore, it's likely that this story was written in the 19th, late 19th century. OK, do you have questions about today's reading? Right. Next week, please finish the handout. We have one more story. It is. How uh, what was it to build a fire? Right. To build a fire by Jack London, starting on page 17. So it's only it's only 10 pages, not very long. It's also a very, very classic, famous, interesting story. 
let me talk to you about this. Jack London was one of the most popular writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He was mainly a novelist. And he was famous for being a kind of explorer. He spent time in Alaska. He spent time in the West. And so a lot of his work has to do with nature. So here it says 1903, uh, his breakthrough novel, The Call of the Wild, is about a dog who slowly meets wolves in the wild and becomes rewilded. Later in 1906, he followed this up with another novel called White Fang. This is a story of a wolf who meets a man in the wild, realizes that the man can give him food, follows him back, and slowly becomes domesticated. So these two stories are kind of the opposite of each other, but they both get into a lot of great descriptions of dogs and wolves and of the relationship between these animals and humans. And they're written from the perspective of the animal. Even today, these are very good novels. If you have time, you can go find one and read it. Even in the Chinese version, it's worth reading. Now, London wrote in the early 21st, uh, sorry, early 20th century. At this point, the main thinking was social Darwinism and naturalism. I talked about this earlier, but I think I went too fast. So let me review for you. Social Darwinism. Darwinism, Darwin Zhui, is about evolution, Yinhua Lun, right? So like according to Darwin, different species compete and only those who win the competition can live and propagate their descendants and become dominant species. Social Darwinism takes that idea and applies it to human society. Why are some people successful and other people not? Why are some people rich and other people poor? Why do some people live long and others die young? According to social Darwinism, it is because the poor, the uh, those who die young, these people are not fit for society. Wu Jing Tianzi Shi Zhe Sun survival of the fittest in society. Now, today, most of us don't believe this. Today, most of us believe that people are poor and unhealthy because they are unlucky. They were unlucky to be born in a worse part of society, in an unfortunate family, from an unfortunate background. Some people are worse off because of racism or discrimination and that it is the obligation of society to help take care of these less fortunate people. But that's not what they thought back then. Back then they thought if you die young, it's your fault. Connected to that is the literary movement called naturalism. Naturalism takes the method of realism. It gives us a realistic picture of people and their lives, but it's usually a pessimistic picture and big one. It's fatalistic. The idea is that some people, even good people, will come to a bad end through no fault of their own, simply because fate is working against them. Well, OK, not completely faultless. Maybe the person makes one mistake, and because of fate, that mistake becomes a deadly mistake. So the fault is in that very first mistake. If you make that mistake, you are not fit for this environment, and so if you die, you deserve to die. So naturalist stories are usually fatalistic, pessimistic, and very, very logical. If this happens, then that happens. If that happens, then another thing happens. And all, so on and so on until the main character dies. 
reading naturalistic stories can feel oppressive. You're in Yapogan. It can also feel bleak. Uh, like hopeless. Like if you live in that society, you would also be very unlucky. But the way that these stories unfold, the way that fate works in these stories is fascinating. It's like you can feel a bad ending is going to come, but when it does come, the way that it comes is is very interesting. And it makes a lot of sense. It's very logical. It's not like, oh, suddenly like a spaceship appeared and aliens kill you. It's more like in this story to build a fire. It's more like the protagonist. Is in Alaska. And he's trying to walk back to his main camp. But you know, it, it feels kind of cold. Probably no big deal. I heard some people say it's going to get really cold and you don't want to be stuck out here at night when it's so cold. No big deal. I'll just hurry and I'll get there before night falls. OK, but then maybe he's walking along and then he doesn't notice, but his foot gets stuck under some ice. He pulls his foot out, but. His foot is now wet. And in that cold weather, if your body is wet, you're going to die. So he stops and he tries to build a fire. And you know, when it's very cold and you're kind of in a panic, it's not easy to build a fire. Even though that you know that this fire will save your life, it can be easy to make a small mistake. Maybe you have to start over. Maybe when you start over, you realize you don't have enough wood. Maybe when you're finally ready and your fire is just about to start growing and going to help you unfreeze your foot. You forgot to build your fire in an open space. And so the tree above you gets heated up and the snow on the tree falls off its leaf and onto your fire. And maybe that small mistake is enough to kill you. Also, there's a dog in the story. But the dog. I mean, dogs are cute, but cuteness is a double edged sword. So that should be fun for you to read. So please finish this handout before next week. Next week. We will discuss the story and then I will introduce the midterm exam. The midterm exam will begin at the end of class next week. You will have one week to finish the exam on Moodle. So two weeks later, you still have to come to class, but it will still be during the exam time because the exam will end at midnight in two weeks. So during class, you will still probably be doing the exam. So we're not going to do too much. I'm just going to pass out a new handout and introduce the next literary period. So during the exam week, you don't have to read anything except for what you have to read for the exam. Questions? Okay, cool. See you next week.